All right, so um, welcome everybody. This is a TAC advisory committee meeting for September 12th. And um, I'm gonna just do a quick roll call of the members to help. Oh, we need uh -huh. to do the magic words, yeah. Oh, okay, sure. I have Pursu that. Pursuant ahead. to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order spending so certain provisions of the open meeting law, this meeting of the TAC is being conducted by a remote participation. Excellent. Okay. Um, so I was just going to go ahead and just um, list who's here. Um, just so when Amber's taking the minute, she has that information readily available. So um, we have Guilford and we have me and Stephanie Trigarell who's joining us and members uh, Kim and Chris Lindstrom and uh, Stefan and Stefan, can we just, just make sure you can hear us? Say hi or something. <laughs> You, yep, you got okay. two people on the attendee. Okay, great. And um, great. Let's um, yeah. So can we just let people in? So Jacob, he's from Drop Mobility as well, and Joe Federico, who's so we also have Joe, Amber, and um, our guests, uh, Jeff Goodmark and uh, Jacob, Jacob Allen Roberts. Awesome. All right. Welcome, everybody. So I did have on the agenda that the first item was public comment period, but I don't see any members of the public here. So let's just go ahead. And um, I'm very excited that uh, uh, that Drop Mobility people are here to talk about the Valley Bike Share and Stephanie is here to give the Amherst perspective as well. But uh, go ahead, Jeff, you have the floor. Or if you, Jacob wants to speak first, that's fine, too. Sure. I mean, um, thank you very much for having us and including us in the meeting. And we, you know, are happy to provide as much information as, um, you know, you, you you would love to know about uh, where we're at. But I almost think that it would be more uh, informative if Stephanie let us in the questions as to what the kind of things that are coming up. And so we can start with that as a perspective so we know what to discuss. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, um, before before Stephanie does that, I mean Jeff and Jacob, and I mean occasionally, you know, people do also tune into these uh, because the meetings are recorded. People will tune in and watch it, you know, on YouTube later. Can you just kind of give a quick overview of, you know, that you guys have launched and sort of, you know, your experience a little bit with it? I know that Drop Mobility has a lot of systems, but also just sort of where the system is now. Um, just for those at home who have not been following like all the minutia of Valley Bike Share. And in fact, you guys launched in August and the UMass students weren't back then and things like that. So can I, I mean, maybe it would be helpful if I give a little background okay, to sure. what happened that led us to this point. So excellent. Thank you. So essentially, um, so Valley Bike at the time that it went dark had roughly, I believe at that time we had eight communities that were participating uh, in the network. And originally it started with only five communities and over time we were growing the network. And so um, we were partnered with Bouygan, who was a firm out of, or an establishment out of, Cali uh, out of Canada. And they had networks globally. So Amherst was not, you know, one of the few, they actually had them all across the United States. And then they also had them in, in Europe and in Canada and elsewhere. Um, so unfortunately they had a pretty bad business model. And so they didn't really account for the operations costs of the system. So unfortunately they were seeing that as something that could be provided and um, supported by membership fees and sponsorships, which, you know, is something is true that we would continue to do, but there wasn't really any expectation that the communities were going to have to put up any significant funding to support the operational costs. Um, and it was really relying specifically on sponsorship. Like there was just a lot of effort that was based on the sponsorships. And yet there wasn't a lot of support in helping the communities get that sponsorship. Some communities were very successful, Northampton, Springfield. It was a lot easier for them to secure sponsorship. In Amherst, we really struggled. We had a really hard time because the stations aren't inexpensive and our local businesses found it very challenging to be able to 
provide, you know, $15,000 for a station, you know, um, annually. So that was really kind of a bit of a challenge. And then we got to a point and we were not also, I should say that the advisory committee, the communities, we were not ever privy to the, um, the operational income that they were receiving. So we really didn't know about the financial situation. So it kind of blindsided us when they said to us at one point, you know, we either need this funding from the communities or we're basically, you know, not gonna be able to operate. And so I think we managed to keep it going just till like the end of a season. Um, and then essentially it just went dark because they just had no more, uh, no more ability to, financially support the network. And not just in Amherst, but actually everywhere. I think there was one community, they sort of kept going for a little while and then that tanked as well. So um, so really it was not because our system was not successful, it was actually quite successful. We were doing really well. We had pretty strong ridership and membership and we had communities that wanted to join. So we were expanding the network. The communities were expanding the number of stations within each community. Um, UMass, as you probably all well know, is part of that system as well. So we were really doing really well. So it was very um, disconcerting when, when the whole thing went dark and we were sort of left to scramble. So, um, Northampton is the lead community for this effort, but there is an advisory committee with representatives of which I am one that have been meeting. I'm actually, I and Ezra Small from UMass are the only original members who have started right out the gate from the very beginning of the program. So Ezra and I are kind of, you know, in it for the long haul, but um, Northampton has always served as the lead community in this effort, but Amherst has worked very, very closely with Northampton all along. And so we were trying to figure out, you know, what to do, and we were trying to figure out how we could make this um, this a viable network again. So we had put out an RFP, and actually, oh, actually, just a request for um, for quotes. So to sort of get an idea, or a request for information. I'm sorry, just to get an idea of what would a company, what would it take for a company to get a system going, and then how much would it really cost the communities? Like, what would our investment be in this? Because we were recognizing that the communities may need to make an investment to make this work, not un are not dissimilar to the, the Pioneer Valley transportation system. So anyway, we got information and we came up with, um, you know, we had at least five or five or so different um, program systems uh, that were um, made aware to us and what they thought it would financially cost. And then we put out an RFP. We had um, four, I think it was four um, vendors respond. And after interviewing and looking at the costs and the structure, and we ended up um, obviously happily landing with Drop Mobility, who has been a wonderful partner. So I don't know if that's a good segue for you, Jeff. Yeah, that's great. I really appreciate all that. Up, how did we get here backstory? Um, and all of that is obviously true. And Drop is a company that has a slightly different view about how to build a sustainable business model in this world of micro mobility and in micro sharing. And it's, uh, more complex to set up these arrangements up front, having a complex relationship with the cities in which we're operating, as well as our riders, as well as being um, able to be, be in a position to receive grant funding and other things like that that are necessary for this. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, like, yeah, you guys had a lot of rides in the old system, but the way that ops works for the most part is that if a customer rides a bike and spends you know three dollars on their ride that probably cost ops two dollars and 95 cents to make that ride happen and so there's just like not a lot of meat on the bone and that's if they're good in many systems it costs them five dollars um and it's just a very difficult business model which needs to be thought of as transportation full stop just as subsidies go for all sorts of transportation that cities have bus service especially micromobility needs to be viewed with the same light. And when that happens, it will really free up cities to be able to really implement these programs on a fully effective level. You know, while Valley Bike is, is, is certainly built out and there's a lot of really great qualities about it, you know, we probably need twice as many stations as we have. 
And, you know, there's communities that we are small communities and pockets that we skip over just because they're not like able to compete or come up with enough funds to like buy into this program. And if funding were all level and that was something that was expected a city to have, you know, it would just be a different ballgame altogether. Um, so that being said, we looked at this project um, as a. Uh, something that we knew was going to be successful from day one. Um, and so we were excited to get on board with it. And we are taking a much longer term view of what Valley Bike will be in spring of 2026, or by the time the students come back to school for the fall of 2026. Like we have a lot of work to do. Um, we need to get some funding. We need to change out some old hardware. Um, most of the hardware that is purchased and owned in the system is designed 10 years ago. And while that's not uh, a very long time chronologically, in technology terms, that's a very long time ago. And there's been many things that this industry has discovered work a lot better than what we're dealing with in, in this system. And so it's our goal to, as we expand into more cities, as we change out cities, um, to be adding brand new technology that's just a lot easier to use and a lot better experience for the rider. Um, so far, uh, we have done, let's see here, 4,161 trips since we've launched. And we've had about 2,400 people download the our new app and sign up with an account. Um, these are just some really, really high level metrics. Um, 7,500 minutes total total riding minutes that we that we've done um and uh i really think that where all of the things that we wanted to see initially are all happening and it all uh, uh foretells good things to come in the future um we have had a little bit more uh some more hardware issues than we had anticipated um mostly due to the fact that technology that sits in a garage idle for 18 months just doesn't it just doesn't age well it's Bikes, especially bikes are all about being ridden. And so when they sit, they just kind of like get get stiff and they're not great. Um, but we're working through all that and things have been going great. Um, Jacob, who's on this call and Edgar, who's our um, lead tech for this program, have both been doing an amazing job uh, being in the community and just trying to figure out whatever solutions there are that are out there. Um, you know, and also, also, as Stephanie alluded to, like what works in Northampton might not be what works in, in, in Holyoke. And, and we just don't know what those things are going to be. And so we're open to, to taking on all of those problems as they come to us and as we can, you know, figure out what those things are. Does anyone else have any other specific um, questions or anything else that they wanted to know about that I maybe didn't talk, mention, Kimberly? Yeah, just curious, how many bikes are in Northampton? Uh, sorry, Amherst. Uh, that's not a super simple question to answer at the moment. Right. I'm sure, um, but I can tell you that it's, um, let me just load these here real quick. And also, I guess, how many bikes are in the system, right? Sure. Looks like right now in Amherst, there's, somewhere around 30 vehicles, maybe 40. Um, we have, we, we launched on day one with 297 vehicles active. Um, we've had a lot of issues since then. That number has been as low as 150 for days already, where basically half of what we put out has already had to get repaired. Um, mm -hmm. Today we're operating around 225, um, but that number changes daily, uh, actually changes throughout the day. We're constantly, repairing bikes and deploying them. So anytime that you're sort of asking that question, you're just getting a snapshot of what this, yeah. what the data is saying right now. Cool. And if I just could, I want to jump in that the new, the new um, bikes that we're getting from Drop Mobility, which I think the only location where they're launched right now is Springfield. That, that's there, we launch, we will launch them in Springfield next week. Finally, okay. we've been doing working for nonstop to switch out all their old hardware. Um, it's almost complete and we're ready, to, almost ready to go there. So can you tell us a little bit about the new bikes? Like what's the difference with them? Um, so they're, they're, the idea is that they're uh, a much more uh, simple design, which is e way easier to repair 
and overall less expensive and overall should lower operation costs tremendously. And all of the parts are um, within our control. And so we can get the things that we need to keep these bikes uh, operational. They have some different technologies on them, the way that they work and interact with the world. Um, and the batteries, the biggest thing that's probably noticeable is that the batteries are swappable. Um, and so what that means is that our team charges the batteries in our warehouse and they go out in the morning and they change all the batteries on the bikes. Um, so there's no downtime in bikes being too low battery and they have to go to a dock for 24 hours to charge or anything like that. Is that the case with the current technology? It needs to charge if they're down, they have to charge. There's, for it's not 24 hours always, but there's a number of things that happen with these bikes. One of them is that when they go offline, they also lose their GPS signal and they stop reporting and our system can't find them. We have to physically oh, find them in the world. Yeah to get them back charged, to right. get them back online so we can then track them even at all, which is not, not a great, uh, not a great plan. Um, yeah. Our, our bikes that we use now have the GPS technology is completely independent of the bike battery. And so they they never go out and they don't go offline. Right. Just one of the many technological upgrades that have been in the industry since then. So what's important for us in our communities is that one of the big things that we had to do when we were getting new stations, every time we got a new station is we had to make sure that we had electric supply available. And so part of the of locating the stations had to do with having access to power. And it also was, you know, more money to tie in. And if it was uh, any kind of a distance over 10 feet, it was a substantial amount of money to, to get that electricity hook up together. Yeah. So, and so our technology allows for that to not, not be needed. We also have our own version of docking technology, which we'll probably use in some of the cities here, especially because the sites already have electrical power to them, the hard part's already done. Um, but for future sites, we're not limited to um, where that electricity is available. So I, I just have a like um a practical question, like, for example, like if you're switching out the bikes in Springfield, but then say somebody goes from Holyoke to Springfield or Chicopee to Hink, and like somehow there's like cross, you know, kind of contamination, if you will, of the system, like are yeah. the other bikes still going to, are they just going to need to be picked up and like put back yep. in the part of the system where they work? Basically, yes. Okay. But from the rider experience, the rider, if that happens, will be able to end their trip either way because of the way that the geofencing works, the digital side of it. Um, as long as they go to one of those hubs, even if they can't hook the bike up to it, it'll still allow them to end their trip and we'll figure the part, so, we'll figure the part so, after. And if if electricity isn't needed at the um, stations themselves, it sounds like, mm -hmm. right? It's because it's independent with the battery charging, then it seems like could the cost potentially go down like per station? Oh, yeah. Too. absolutely so. absolutely 100%. or even as like stephanie was saying you know at the amherst town hall for example you don't necessarily need to hook it up to like new electricity again if we had those other bikes exactly so that's what and i will our new our i think our new station will be a drop station in that location i would think i think that's the idea because it isn't in amherst so there's only one other station right it's right the only, yeah, there's only one other one that was never actually online. I don't think it ever went live because it gotcha. was taken apart. But at this point, I think because we have that beautiful new common space, we don't right. have to do anything to drill holes or sure you know, for electricity. So I think we're getting new equipment for that station. That's great. I, I, I think mean, that sounds right, but I don't want to say I don't, I can't answer that because I just don't know the answer and it exists somewhere in a, in a pile of a trillion emails that I cannot pull up in front of me at the moment. And I think that will be great too. Just, I think it will really, I think it is really vital to have that station operational again, you know, as, as we're saying, like we only have the one station in downtown Amherst. Yeah, totally. So hopefully without needing the electricity that will help get it online sooner, which I think would be like fantastic. That's also like very close to the town hall is also like a major transit hub. I mean, one, it's an activity hub in the center of downtown, but it's also like where you can get a lot of buses going a lot of different areas you know very well connected to the pbta well and that was our main that yeah. was our main kiosk that right. was where that was the right. only place that had a kiosk so it was our main station yeah which is why the loss of it right now has been 
a bit problematic, but you know, we know it's launching in the spring. We'll have it back in the spring. So it's just a matter of being patient. And and I mean the other station, the other station on the end of the other end of downtown, it's not that far. Right. Kendrick I Park, mean right. yeah, Kendrick Park, right. it's like less than a mile. So it's close. It's just it's just helpful to have it like in the center. And particularly like if we're looking to it like having more use by like Amherst College students or other Right. Other people who are um, right now. And so that just reminds us to let's think of this whole system as not like what we have today. Today is like the first inning. Like we have to think about like the long game and what we can build it into. And so all of these ideas are all great and we want the, to make them all happen. We just have to figure out how to make the, the you know, the, the finances make sense for everybody. And then we'll, and then we can build out all these things. Um, I really want to just thank you for your time. I unfortunately have to run to another meeting oh, that I have you. tonight. Thank you. And um, if you have any other questions that come up, I think Jacob is still on the call. But um, you guys all also can email me if anything else you think of that you didn't uh, think of, and I'll be happy to answer for you. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks Jeff. See ya. Uh, and hey, See um, hey, Jacob, can you uh, can we can I ask yeah. a couple questions? <laughs> um, can I mean, you hear me? Yeah, we can definitely hear you. Oh. Wonderful. I uh, had a hard time getting LinkedIn on my laptop, so I'm on oh. my phone, and oh, so it's, I'm a little that. limited in what I can see and okay. how I can participate. But I'm glad you can hear me. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you are. Can you just describe sort of your role, or because it sounds like you're going to be you're involved most probably with like the day to day operations of the region and probably helping yeah. your team is probably helping get bikes where they need to go and like kind of all that <clears throat> those logistics and sure uh so as the operations manager um a lot of what i will be doing and i say that in a future tense because up until now a lot of it's really been just setting the system back up with the bikes and the stations and a lot of that due diligence um is going to be more the community community engagement piece so, for example, uh, as we launch the program, we want to do some educational work in the communities, uh, give the municipalities an opportunity to have some press um, and invite their community to come out and take a test drive on the bikes, et cetera, et cetera. Learn about the technology, speak with us in person, um, learn about Valley Bike in general, you know, kind of what what the I, I think a lot of people were curious to know what happened to Valley Bike because it was successful, then it disappeared and now it's back. So, you know, we have sort of a canned response for that. Um, so we will be, for example, at your block party um, on the 19th. And we'll have, I think, four or five of the new bikes that will be offline, but they'll be working. So people uh, can just, you know, will hopefully set up a, a path that they can go on a ride. Um, we do have helmets available for demos. Clearly, uh, state law doesn't... Um, necessitate uh, helmet use for for bike riders, but we like to have that safety precaution there. Um, if you've never ridden an electronic uh, pedal assist bike in particular versus a throttle type bike, uh, it does take a little to get used to that first half pedal and you get that push. And if you're not ready for it, um, it's going to be a, a bit of a surprise. <laughs> um, so, you know, just even though it's riding a bike and I think, you know, most people out there know what it's like to ride a bike. I, there's some initial um, sort of handholding we like to do, especially for newbies. Um, uh, beyond that, um, I'm kind of overall, uh, we just staffed up. We went from Beyond Edgar and myself from three staff members to 12 in the past two weeks. Um, clearly, we've done most of our hiring from the local area. Um, so that's really just we're training a lot of people, um, both on the old system, the Bowiegan system in terms of repair and operations. But we're also cross-training everybody on the new drop system that'll be coming in, as Jen Jeff mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you can look to me uh, in the future uh, as it relates to attending planning meetings, uh, uh, being available for you know, public um, engagement of any type, whether it's just responding to emails or attending a, a webinar like this. Um, I think as the, the system uh, becomes more and more eager to grow in the tapestry um, is sort of filling out. Um, there's some ways in which I think internally we're discussing um, how to get other institutions to get into the network. So again, I don't know exactly how that's going to shake out because of the business model that Jeff mentioned. But you know, when you look at hospital complex, large employment centers, housing complexes, um, entertainment centers, et cetera, et cetera, um, because uh, what was mentioned earlier, because our system now can be 
um, sort of feathered out much more um, robustly than our current system because we don't need to bring power everywhere, the type of integration we can get into the community with this bike network is is much greater than we currently have. So strategically, um, you know, I know you have on your agenda safe routes to schools. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I was in a meeting the other day with the Holyoke uh, Bicycle Pedestrian um, Committee, and they are, are also doing that work. Um, they've also talked about some integrations with PVTA. The challenge is these bikes cannot be loaded onto a PVTA okay. um, rack. However, PVTA could potentially integrate with us so that um, you know, in the future, your maybe your bus pass is also uh, a universal bike pass as well. So that last mile solution for people riding the bus um, could be fully integrated. So you know, I guess I say all that to say and to reinforce what Jeff was saying is that there's there's a lot of uh, creativity and a lot of brainstorming that can be done. Sure. Um, as as it relates, and I'll kind of leave it at this, also to outreach, you know, clearly we have the valleybike.org website. Um, we are uh, very active on social media, on Instagram in particular. And then with the app itself, we haven't really used it yet, but we have the capacity to run a banner. So of those, uh, you know, what do you say, 2,000 people now currently signed up uh, for the new app, we could run everything from a, a positive thought of the day, a weather report to an actual uh, promotion, you know, um, whether it's supporting local businesses, uh, attending an event, uh, we could incentivize people to use the bikes, uh, prove to us they use the bike, they get a discount or whatever it may be. So there's a lot of fun stuff we can do uh, to encourage ridership and, and uh, get more and more people using the network. And to answer your question, I did pull up our map. We have 80 bikes right now currently in North and South Amherst. And that, of course, includes. So, US. I mean, so actually, so I had a question because like Jeff had mentioned on the day that you guys started, you know, the launch day, which was just about a month ago, that there were about 300 bikes. So how many bikes are in the system now that are working? Do you know? -ish? I'm pulling it up right now. Mm -hmm. I thought the number was two. Yeah, so. We have right now 180 that are available to rent. Um, so that, you know, of course takes out, uh, we have undeployed bikes that are broken and in the shop being fixed. We have about 40 bikes that are low battery, so they are not able to be rented. So we have to, unfortunately with the, as he mentioned this, the Bowiegan technology, we actually have to gather those bikes up and bring them to a charging station or bring them back to the shop rather than just dropping in a new battery, no pun mm -hmm. intended. Yeah. Um, we have six missing bikes. Um, so these are types of things that I, again, in terms of protocol, I don't know, Stephanie, maybe you can speak to if the, if the, uh, partner communities get, a like a biweekly or a monthly report, or, or if you have live access to these statistics or not. Um, but if, if, if need be, I'd be happy to generate reports and, and submit them to the group if they're not currently being done. So we, um, we get monthly reports and I was sending those to the town manager and to the finance director as they came in each, each month. Um, and I don't know, I can't remember what a, the contract said with you all. If uh, I'm, I have to assume that that was part of an expectation that we'd be getting reports because I mean, we, yeah, are no. at, we are looking at that data. Great. I mean, to me, it seems like, I mean, given the fact that like the system right now is covering a pretty big geographic area, including both like Hampshire County and Hamden County and Springfield Chickpea and so on. But it seems, I mean, I can think of places around Amherst or, you know, where I'd love to, or UMass or where, where I'd love to see stations, but at the same time, like if there's only currently not that many bikes in the system, mm -hmm. it also seems mm -hmm. like it's crucial to sort of like add more bikes just to make it yeah, like, our... so that people can rely on it. You know, if they, for example, right. bike to, they bike to get, well, first of all, they have to find a bike, but if they get a bike and they go somewhere, like, can they use that bike to get back or things like that? And so, yeah, um, and, and, I, I think... and I was really grateful too. Like I know initially when the system launched, right, it said with the memberships that you get um, 30 minutes free a day. Well, given the fact that the stations are spread out, like I know that my 30 minutes was like, boom, it was gone. Yeah. And so it was really great that that extended to be an hour a day, yeah. um, just to be like more risk realistic with the t people's time. But, yeah. So. And that's something that we're going to work out, I think, over time is, you know, with our group, 
with boots on the ground here in Pioneer Valley and the, you know, our higher ups sort of spread out all over the country and even in Canada, some of them, um, you know, it's just, I think for us, uh, you know, we're fairly new to, you know, how the information exchange is working. So for example, um, I'm getting more involved in sponsorship and promotions, um, but the people I work with within my company are in New York City. So they they rely on me to give them a lot of feedback. So I have to now turn back to you guys eventually and really begin kind of facilitating that conversation because it doesn't just sit on my desk. <laughs> so I'm the middleman with a lot of this stuff. Sure. So anything you want to run, um, whether it's, again, growing the system or inviting potential new partners in, um, you know, I think these are things that I can organize, um, you know, meetings that go beyond the monthly stakeholder meeting. Right. Well, and I think too, I was curious too, and maybe Stephanie can um, speak to it a little, but just in terms of like the contract, like what is the contract, like in terms of expanding the system or anything, are there guidelines for that in it? That so can I, if I could jump yeah, in. Yeah, please. Yeah, absolutely. So please. really, I mean, really, Tracy, this committee wouldn't, you would work with me. Yeah, of course. Because the advisory committee are really the ones that have been working on the grant funding and the station expansions and, um, you know, doing all, all we need to do on our end to sort of get the stations physically in the community. But one of the things that we really could use support with is certainly trying to secure a sponsorship and, you know, getting entities to get on board, getting businesses on board. So I think the more we can get the word out about um, these opportunities, I think that would be extremely useful. And, and I think you all having ideas would want to coordinate through me and taking that back to, to drop into our, um, to Northampton, because really Northampton is the lead community. So technically when you're asking about the contract, the contract is actually between Northampton and drop mobility. Okay. So that's why I'm, I'm sort of stepping in here because, um, it's really, it, it wouldn't totally be appropriate to sort of having the TAC be the ones to deal. No, no, not that. at all. I was just but, kind of um, curious about like how growing the system works. And yes. And the reason I asked about the contract is just in terms of, you know, sometimes contracts lay out those kind of like details about like the system will be this big or this big. And we don't, I we mean, don't even have, though. So. Yeah, we don't, it's not that specific. I mean, okay. I can talk to the contract because we have a copy of it and I, no, um, I, I so, was just curious about, but I can tell you mm -hmm. that it's not, I mean, it's really expensive to add stations. And so what we have been doing, I mean, how we were able to even get the system um, developed in the first place was through um, CMAC funding, community mitigation and congestion funding through air quality um, through your, yeah. so, so that's a, that's actually a federal program. Um, so we were able to get funding through that and we secured something like a million dollars, I think, in the first go round. And then we had another round with another million dollar funding that supported the entire network. So each community was allotted a certain number of big bikes. There's a whole um, there's a whole calculation as to how we determined what the cost would be per station and how many bikes people would get. And, you know, there's all of that information is I think on um, Northampton's uh, Valley Bike website because they were the ones who were sort of coordinating it. And we were working very, very closely with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. So they were the ones who really helped uh, as well sort of secure the sponsorship. Um, they were the ones who put out the RFP initially way back in the beginning. So um, there's a long history and there's lots of paperwork and I'm happy to share that, but I don't yeah. necessarily want no, to spend the meeting time with No, it. no, no, not during the meeting time. So Wait, I, I, I have a question. Yeah. Why not, why doesn't the bike, what, so the main expense seems to be the batteries and the electricity. Why doesn't, why don't, and, and most of the rides seem to be very short, at least what I see, at least around UMass. Why aren't there regular bikes available? That seems to like alleviate a lot of the problem. I mean, you you would obviously have to have trackers and whatever. It's not that it's not just the batteries. The bikes themselves are expensive. Yeah, I would think. But a bike is not expensive. No, a regular these bike. These bikes. Like, no, I don't. No, not electric. A regular bike that you power with your feet. Yeah, part of the problem that we found in this area too is that it's um, it's 
it's fairly hillier. And the thing about having an electric assist system is that it actually has greatly expanded the number of riders that can sign on and have memberships in the system. And so, I mean, I Jacob can maybe speak to why we're, I mean, I think most bike programs at this point are transitioning to all electric. Well, I don't think there's many. I understand, but it like it, no, in it, this area where there's lots of students using it and like really my guess is, and Jacob maybe can attest to this or maybe you can, the rides in Amherst cannot be that far because there really aren't that many places to go yeah. here. So overall, with our entire um, network, which of course includes Springfield, West Springfield, Chicopee, et cetera, the average trip length is uh, 13 and a half minutes. So yeah. again, Chicopee, you have, I think, three stations and it's a postage stamp. And people aren't really going to go from Chicopee to some far, you know, right. all the way down to Springfield or something like that. Whereas East Hampton, I mean, preaching to the choir, but East Hampton, North yeah. Hampton, the railroad, the distance, you know, yeah. more maybe recreational ride versus just going to work or running an errand. Mm. So the the different sort of the 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 makeup of the user groups are are different. And I think to the point of what kind of bikes drop mobility can bring into the network, <clears throat> we're fairly agnostic, I think, as to what kind of bicycle. Um, we could bring in trikes, we could bring in pedicabs, we could bring in all kinds of um, assets, if you want to look at it like that, that could serve a, a series of uh, problems, i.e. people who are mobility impaired, the two wheel bike is extremely difficult, people that mm -hmm. are of a certain age um, are have a hard time riding the two wheel bike, so the trike is stable, has a larger basket, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we've had small businesses ask us if they could use our bike network for delivery system. So mm. you mean, there's all kinds of different things. And I guess to Stephanie's point about the, the grade, um, you know, Holyoke, I, almost every one of these communities other than the farthest north, I think Florence, Northampton, have some pretty significant hills to have to, to get around. And as somebody who's an avid uh, bicyclist myself and thinks of himself as being in fairly good shape, some of those hills are will crush me, <laughs> you know, and... And just yeah, but pass. most people aren't doing that. Like that, my what? point is the only but hill. You have the, the the electric assist. Like for example, State Street in Springfield, Fine. you That's can it. go from downtown up to the museums without without even barely. You just you're you're really casually pedaling, and that motor is bringing you right up the hill. Um, but it also the distance you can cover, right. you know, is like and, you're really not exerting a lot of energy and, with the with that. And I think the last thing I'll say about it is I think just in terms of bikes that are quote unquote dumb bikes, good old regular old bikes. There's just so many out there on marketplace and on, you can get bikes for 10, 20 bucks. If you really, if you're a college kid and you just want a bike to ride around on, mm, you can get one. You don't need a bike share for that type I, of bike. I, that's my, yeah, I guess that's my. I, I know, but most people aren't going to have one on campus because there's just no place. Well, I mean, there are, you know, if you look at the dorms, they always have tons of bikes. But and yeah, um, I can tell you that other, it's not a place to keep a bike, but whatever. Just one other point, Kimberly. Also, you have to realize that this is the entire system. So part of the reason is that that might work great in Amherst, but we also, right. the bikes are moving around to each community. Yeah. They're not just staying right. here. So looking at the overall system, there's not the demand for those bikes as much as there is for the electric assist, because it's also a time piece. You know, it's not just... It, it's also these are these are similar to like, you know, if you're just running an errand and you want to be quicker yeah. about it, this gets you mm -hmm. to do that errand or get you to that location faster than if you didn't have this electric assist. Mm -hmm. So part of it is also is like it's really just a quicker form of using a bike, but it's also getting you to that last mile. Again, but, seeing it I as mean, transportation, not as recreation. I do think that people, I mean, knowing people, like the people I know who have e-bikes or also in these systems, like in a lot of cities now have, you know, um, shared systems like micro mobility systems. And for most of the ones I've seen in like DC and New York and San Francisco, like all, a lot of these systems, I mean, they all say that they have the e-bikes, e-assist bikes and the not e-assist bikes, but at almost all the stations I've ever been to, like the e-ones are just in a lot more demand. And the idea, I mean, for people I know who own an e-bike, that they feel like 
just having the e-bike and having it, you know, it helps a little on hills. It keeps people biking, like, as they get older more. Um, and then people are willing to substitute, like, use the e-bike instead of getting in their car. Like, well, a, lot of guess, car, guess... a lot of car trips are, like, three to five miles, too. Right. Yeah. But for some reason, like, I mean, if you look at kind of national commute data from like the census, like only like less than 5% of people commute by bike. So like people mentally just have this idea, but if it's got an e-assist, like I think people think of it, they can think of it more as like a faster vehicle and it involves less exertion or, or whatever. I mean, I, think I guess that, I'm just thinking like, if we really so. want to, I mean, 40 bikes in all of Amherst is kind of ridiculous. Like we could put more bikes out there. We don't need to raise $15,000 per station. We don't need to buy. I have no idea how much an e-assist bike works, uh, costs, but, but you know, I don't know if that's what we're really trying to do. I mean, we, I mean, I once, think, I think once we, we get all of our, I'm sorry to jump in. Ahead, once we no. get all of our bikes that are in, being repaired, which there were many uh, that came out of Westover Air Force Base that we are still oh. wrenching on. Um, so the goal in the near future is to have about 350 in circulation. <clears throat> and that's, where, that's, where, that, that's no, in the whole network. Oh, so yeah. we would, we would be adding about another 150 bikes yeah. that we already have in-house that so just that, need some repair and a lot so of it is software just i mean I, not not to get into the weeds but you know our software engineers are having to troubleshoot a lot of things in real time because they've adopted an older net you know an older system that they're trying to work through and integrate with our system so there have been issues with you know all kinds of for example people seeing six bikes in a chickabee station and can't undock any of them so we get a report hey we can't get these and then our software engineers really have to work on it. And by the end of the day, they figured it out. So there, there's been a lot of hiccups along the way. So I, I, I do hope yeah. that the folks, um, you know, that, that have <clears throat> faith in it becoming much more um, successful, I guess, at the end, uh, we'll, we'll give it just a little bit more time. And I think you'll see a lot more people. When we were at UMass for bike day, I think we signed up 72 students. We were awesome. we were mobbed with students, uh, especially foreign born students that really were excited that they had this opportunity to to get, you know, these bikes so they can go around town and so, do what they need to do. Yeah. So Jacob, so what's your um do, is uh drop mobility expecting to have the 350 bikes in the system like this fall, or would some of them not be until the spring? Yeah, with our staffing up, a lot of the people that we hired are, are techs, are, are people okay. that are getting these bikes fixed. I mean, if you can imagine, we prioritize simple fixes like flat tires and brakes right. and seat posts and things like that. And now this last batch is a little more, um, you know, opening the bikes up and it's, you know, monitors and computer parts and things like that. So um, we're, yeah, we are hoping um, right now we're in the middle of... Um, switching over the Bowiegan stations in Springfield to the drop stations. Oh. So by next week, if you find yourself in Springfield, Mass., you could try the new bike if you don't see us on the 19th. Um, and you'll see those the, the 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 bike racks are just basic stainless steel bike racks that you would see anywhere else. So yes. um, they're really simple to, to install. And um, we are keeping the kiosks or the wayfinders, you know, just for now. So we could use the map. Um, mm -hmm. They're illuminated, um, and then they also have an opportunity for sponsorship and, and advertising on one side. So we did decide to keep those in place for now. Okay. Um, so you mentioned the. Um, so I I just have a couple kind of logistical questions, just the kind of questions that people will ask me too. Um, I think it's great you're keeping the kiosks. Um, so do you have an estimate of when the bikes will be pulled for winter this year, or just gonna play by ear with the weather, or maybe cold, Stephanie. Knows. I think our yeah, I think our mantra right now is cold is fine, wet is not. Right. Okay. So okay. yeah, I mean, as you know, our our winters are kind of changing their personality a little bit. So um, I think you know we're gonna we're gonna keep them out. I mean, these are hardy bicycles that are meant to withstand rain and et cetera, et cetera. Nobody really wants to ride in the rain. Um, but, you know, once it comes time for plows to hit the road and things like that, they, they we will go out and wrangle the bikes. Sure. Yeah. And then um, I but was I, curious. I just wanted to say that the stations are not because, Jacob, in the past, 
it was seasonal. So everything got packed up entirely um, by like December, mid-December, end of December. So that's not happening this season. Okay. No, we're playing. We're going to play it by ear. Yeah, we're going to see. I mean, and I, as long I do as we know can go with them, yeah. there are hardy people who um, like, for example, I mean, you know, I live I live near UMass and also near University Drive. And I mean, one of the uses I saw of the old system, I haven't seen as much this year, but but people biking from the UMass campus to the grocery store on University Drive, the big Y. There's a big station across the street from there. And I can mm -hmm. see, and that's cleared like all winter long. I mean, I can see as long as those bikes are available that students, I mean, yes, there is a bus that runs along that route, but it doesn't run that often at off peak times. And that I can see students, if those stations are there and the bikes are there, like students would be using that corridor yeah. like the whole winter, potentially. That, yeah, and <laughs> um, I think safety example, is really um, just going to be our biggest concern. If the right, roads get no, slick yeah. or icy, we right, just right. don't want injuries. <clears throat> and then in, in terms of safety, um, uh, how are the lights at night? Like, so I know sin, like, since the first, uh, the original system um, had first launched, like in last year, the state passed a law about that you have to have both like light um, back lights and front lights for all bikes at night. And so hmm. are the bikes, um, and before it was just, you had to have a front headlight and you could have a rear reflector. So are the bikes that the current bikes are also the drop mobility, the new bikes, do you have those on there? And are they- So the current, how the current bikes have, to have, they have, yeah, the current bikes that have men out have a headlight. Uh -huh. and, uh, well, it's actually a series of small LED lights that project okay. out. And then they have taillights um, kind of on the back of the frame. There are these red taillights. Um, and and that, so do they automatically, do people have to turn them on or off or they just automatically? No, they're always oh. on. Once you deploy okay. them, even during the day, they just, yeah, they don't know if it's night or day. <clears throat> um, I was in a meeting uh, with, uh, like I said, the Holyoke uh, Bike Ped Committee and Mass Bike was uh, maybe a rep of mass bike or maybe they're speaking about mass bike but i guess they're doing a big um bike light giveaway they are like the bike brigade yeah and yeah. and umass umass amherst they're giving away bike lights too yeah yeah so i guess those those are things that again we would be really excited to help support other efforts that maybe aren't mainlined with what we're doing to you know get helmets out get blinkers out get lights mm -hmm. out yeah again one of the things we talked about as a bit of an aside during the winter, if things slow down, could be a great opportunity for us to go visit high schools, meet with the kids, you know, just do some in-place engagement. Um, we could talk right. tech with them. We could talk bikes with them. and We can maybe start an ambassador yeah. program where they so, could get, yeah, subsidized so I, rides for some volunteerism. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. no, that's great. I did have one question about that, though, because I know in the old system, and I guess the stations are still there, that um, Northampton did have stations at, say, the two high schools, the Northampton High School and the Smith Vogue High School. Now, the the official like policies, like the legal disclaimer on the Valley Bike Share Program and for riders says that you have to be at least 18 years of age. 16, so that seems like, oh, does it say 16? Okay, I thought it said 18. It used to be 18. I think we reduced it to 16. Oh, you did? Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. My 16-year-old will be glad to know that. <laughs> so, um, great. Okay. That was my question. I was just, I always wondered with the Northampton system, like, how can you do this if you have to be 18? Um, and I know, like, the UMass students at that um, UMass bike fair that was last week, that there was talk about, like, a UMass membership and you also have mm -hmm. this like special, the $49 membership, like until the end of the calendar year. And um, if there's, mm -hmm. I mean, we're happy to like help, you know, get the word out about those or, or, or all of those offerings. Like, I don't know, do you offer like a, if you math, do you have an offer, offer to like Amherst college students as well, or. It's all the college yeah, I think all that... students. Sorry, Jacob. It's all college students. No, go, go. Okay. Yeah. Cause we, I was just in the meeting with the colleges. We were, um, uh, we met with um, Amber from, from mm -hmm. Drop Mobility. And so okay. that, that promotion is for all students, including high school students. It's not okay. just college students, it's all students. Okay. And what is that? What's that membership rate then? $15 a month, I believe, off the okay, top of my head. I can't remember off the top of my head. I was oh. just curious. And so, and that is, um, you said that's like anybody 16 and up probably. Okay. It's student. Yeah. Well, it, you yeah, know, yeah, of course. Okay. And again, I'd, I'd also 
challenge us to come up with some some fun promos, right? They could be short term, they could be maybe longer term. I'll give you an example. The mayor of Chicopee is looking to incentivize the honor roll students in the high school to get a free pass if they meet honor roll. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's all kinds of fun little things we can do. Um, I think one of the one of the things that we're going to try to do is some critical mass bike rides as well. Really encourage kind of like every, every you can ride your own bike. You don't have to rent a valley bike. You know, come on out. Um, we're doing a, a glow ride with Nueva Esperanza here uh, around Halloween in Holyoke, and um, that's going to be that's kind great. of fun. So yeah, yeah. I mean, there's we're we're open to all kinds of ideas. Like I said, our our yeah. shop here in Holyoke is a lot of local folks that we hired, so there's a lot of eagerness. <clears throat> to get out into the community and 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 sort of be a part of the community, not not just the bike guys. So, so and yeah, what do you, please keep us in you, that loop. And I mean, maybe in Stephanie has a just list. What do you see as like the well? One, I was curious, Stephanie, about um, when you're looking for sponsorships. Are you looking for people just to help support the system, or also to have stations, or like both? Like, can uh, businesses of, say, "Oh, we'd love to have a station"? Or yeah, all of the above. Okay. Um, you know, I, I haven't been um, as directly um, engaged with Amber about the uh, about that piece, um, this go round quite yet because we're still getting Amber stuff and going. No, of um, course. But I, I mean, uh, but there's uh, but there's opportunities for like full station sponsorships. There's opportunities for bike, you know, for like different parts of the bike, um, well, which yeah. which have always existed in terms of like you could have some kind of you know, um, identification on like the crossbar or, mm-hmm. you know, or the basket or yeah, there's up other, well, op- we could talk about that more too, or you could come back and we could kind of It'll, brainstorm yeah, about, I'll... um, so I do recall like, mm-hmm. um, so at a TAC fun. meeting, you know, maybe like two years ago that the district one neighborhood association in North Amherst, they came and they asked us if we would support a proposal to have a station in, um, the mill district now that it has all the housing and things too and that they said at that time that they did have um a business sponsor who was willing to pay underwrite like a lot of the costs mm-hmm. yeah that we were something that's still feasible yeah well if they're still interested they haven't okay, yeah. um the, there was a particular um person who was the point of contact for that um who worked with Cinda Jones, she no longer works with Cinda. Okay. So she was the point of contract that was organizing that. Um, but you know, the, the thing about that, um, all of the stations that we have in Amherst currently are in public locations. And that was one of the, I wouldn't say it was a limiting factor in getting the CMAC funding, but sure. it's it's a, it was a, it's more complicated and not as easy with private locations versus uh, okay. being in the public way so um but that doesn't right. mean you that know or maybe happen. it could be like on like near it i mean especially if you don't have to have these like complicated systems with the electricity like the stations yeah, right I'm, then maybe you could it's a expand game game. it and because because i even think oh, about yeah. like some of the ones that have been put in in amherst they are like very close to like certain businesses or whatever yeah and i'd, I'd even um, say and i might be getting ahead of myself like if you have bike <laughs> bike racks already installed they could be in the future they could be identified as official Mm. stations so uh for example uh we were doing something uh in a at a near a local library and i noticed that they had a series of bike racks so that's something we can note so in the future when we flip over to the drop system we could identify Mm. infrastructure that's already in place that we could qualify as an official drop location um, and then uh, another note is you might be surprised what some of the uh, cities have in storage. We just learned recently that Springfield had gotten funding years ago for bike racks and they never put them all out. Oh, okay. So they contacted us the other day and said, hey, we found 40 bike racks in storage that we already own. Can we use these for some yeah. of the drop racks? And we immediately said 100%. Well, so, I would think, yeah, and yeah. in terms of sponsorships, like one thing in Amherst is that we i mean one you have umass but you also have like large apartment complexes where um where there's a lot of students that live so if you're able like if yeah some of those apartments some would i think some of those apartment um owners would be interested and some would be less interested but 
that could well, be worth, I even say they that could, could be worth pursuing i mean just because there's so yeah. many different ones all around town and i mean some of them you know there are ones downtown that provide you know indoor parking for their tenants and things so they well, might be willing say, to spring can... for yeah, no, <laughs> to no, have no, like geofencing can... around their properties to have like well the, take it one step uh, further imagine yeah, you so. sign an apartment lease and yeah. you have a bike share tied into your lease like right. you know what i'm yeah. saying so no, you can really true. integrate this in um, and the other piece, I mean, the one thing that I think a lot about with stations, and I know it had come up before too, is just also just the piece of like having some station located in Hadley, um, you know, potentially oh, at, I know, nice. at the Hampshire you Mall or the Mountain Farms Mall. And I mean, I remember back, it came to before the Hadley Select Board, the, the L.O. Bean there had offered to have a station, but it just seems like, again, that's a place where people from Amherst are biking a lot mm -hmm. for shopping or yeah. whatever. And so um, I was really excited that this September that um, the UMass transit system, they just launched something where they have an extension of the 31 bus that goes from Sunderland and it goes in South Amherst, it goes to East Hadley road and it turns around. But for the, for the residents on East Hadley road until now, if they wanted to go to the mall, which is in Hadley, they had to like mm -hmm. walk through the fields or some, like figure out how to get there. They had to take the bus into the center of Amherst and then also go back out to the mall, but um, which would be like a 45 minute trip instead of a direct 10 minute trip. And now there's a direct 10 minute trip, which is great. And so, I mean, having, giving people without cars, like access to make those quick trips to the mall, I think it's huge. And we, oh, that I was agree. one of the, in fact, we were even trying to figure out how, you know, maybe we could all sponsor a station in Hadley if Hadley would allow it because right. we've tried, I mean, I would say it's an annual request to them. I mean, it, yeah. And even and this I, and it's, drop came, we tried to get them this time as well. And, right. And I know. understand too, it's not, it's not just like the bike stations, it's also bike lanes and other accommodation. Yeah, there there are, are, it's an ongoing stuff. discussion about <laughs> Yeah, it's so an are, thing I mean, now they have the sidewalks and the, you know, it's, it's easy now. So they but nobody have... shovels the sidewalks. Well, not... but they, they should be. Let's obviously. not get distracted. Anyway, but thank you both. I mean, we did have a few other items we want to cover and um, yeah. <laughs> we'd love to have you come back or, or maybe come back in the spring. And Stephanie, we could talk to you too about like sponsorship or ways that the TAC can help with that. Um, but it's really exciting to see the system up and running again. And mm -hmm. um. Like, I hope it's going well. I hope we have lots of memberships and that we have as many bikes as possible to keep. Yeah. So. No, it's exciting. it's exciting for the whole community. We, oh, you know, definitely. We, it's big smiles on everybody's faces when they see the bikes come out. So it makes my job easier. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> well, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Pleasure to meet you all. All right. Thank you, Stephanie, right. too. Thanks so much. Yep. Bye. Right. Bye. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I got a little long. Guilford's still here, though. Um, so I did have on the agenda, just safe routes, um, to school updates. We can talk about them. Some of them at our next meeting too. Um, the main thing I wanted to ask about is just last year we, um, we tabled at the downtown block party. The block party is set for next Thursday, September 19th. And do we think we should table again? Or do we think we should spend our efforts elsewhere? So. Anybody? I'm okay doing the table. Um, if Guilford, will you give us a spot? But, um, and I can probably get another, um, you know, another person or two. I just, I don't know, whatever marginal publicity we can get for safe routes. Well, and I guess, Chris, and how are your signups like going, the signups going with like the October 9th day? Like, will we get good? Because I felt like that's one I liked to last year. I liked um, giving out the lights, which is great, you know, and I liked um, informing people about the four foot passing law and things, but it was also just like a practical way. I think that we do hit other members of the community to also get and more families too, who didn't come on the Sunday event before school started um, just to tell people about the, like what's going on around the schools and things. So. Yeah. I mean, we haven't started gathering um so electronically we go through we've <clears throat> gone through the superintendent's office the super new super is not doing a month or a weekly email letter 
Um, I've seen that, yeah. yeah they, but it's like alternate weeks and then the other weeks are podcasts and videos. So I have a, it took me a while to figure out who to talk to about that. There's a guy mm-hmm. named who handles <clears throat> media and um, branding, et cetera, for the district. So I am got that request in. Sure. You're just, I'm getting the rally, the school liaisons to go to their principals. And I think we're going to be really reliant on the principals getting their stuff out each week. Okay. Um, but we have a pretty massive sign up list from the past year. That's that awesome. I'll back out to, you know, and ask them to um, re sign up again for this year. And we have um, a school liaison at Pelham Elementary. Ah, nice. So, um, you know, who the heck knows what that's going to be like at Pelham Elementary. But I think in general, it's going to go, um, again, pretty darn well, whether depending at the middle or at the um, elementary schools. But um, I still haven't had. And I know, too. I mean, I remember in the last one, was that spring, that I think it was Heather or whoever, whatever her name, who lives out in Heatherstone. That like on social media, she was like collecting the list too. Yeah, she and did. so I mean, even just kind of reaching families that way. I mean, there's and and you know, like from the event that we had on the Sunday, you know, which had a nice turnout, but um, that it's always good, you know, and like some a number of the families there were new families, right? So it's always nice to reach new families. Yeah, I mean, we had um, about twenty five. Um, new people sign up um, at the back to school event. Um, okay. We'll have less than that sign up at the block party, but it doesn't really matter. It's again, just general awareness and visibility. Yeah, Kim? Um, I was wondering, um, uh, like, you know, um, young adults or are, are young people are also good reps. And I'm, I'm thinking, now that we know a lot of people on a certain team, um, I wonder if they, you know, they and and their thing is moving pedestrian like in the world. Um, maybe we could rally them and maybe the president of the environmental club, who I think I know really well, um <laughs> yeah, to help out with these things. Yeah, so, no, that's great. I, mean, I think that's always a draw. And they, so... they might even be willing to come that night, you know. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking the block party, I think it's like five to nine. And um, uh, and I think like a lot of the like, you know, the town tables and stuff kind of all close up with like the second half of it, right? It's like people right. are there tabling five to seven. So um, Guilford, will you be there or will Amy be there? I know Amy was there last year. We can't hear we you. We can't hear you, Guilford. We'd love to hear what you have to say if you unmute. I'm muted because I'm doing cool things over here. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, you need to and talk we... to Angela Mills to get a spot. Oh, okay. well, last year Angela Mills said talk to DPW and see if you can share with them. We don't have a spot this year. Oh, okay. Um, I don't think we have a spot at all. I was just looking at the list. I was looking at the list earlier, and I don't, I don't think we're doing anything. Okay. There is there is one spot if you wanted to talk to the bid directly that's open according to their map. Yeah, I mean, so what happened last year was I contacted the bid and the bid said contact, you know, the town has so many tables. So contact the town. And then Angela said, why don't you just figure out where you can like squeeze you in or something? I mean, we can also bring our own table. Like we have yeah. tables, but um, if there's no one's something we can- us out. If we, there's something we can use, that'd be awesome. Um, I, I would definitely talk to, well, talk I'll to, reach Angela. Out to Angela. Okay. And then if you want to talk to John Page and they yeah. do have one spot on their map that says open. I mean, are um, there going to be a bunch of town, town tables again? Yes. No, it has, it has everybody listed. Yeah. Um, okay. It has, uh, I was trying to open it again. Hold on. I'll get it. Oh, I haven't, if you want to share, can you share, but. But we'll figure it out. It's okay. We I don't want to take up time with our meeting <laughs> too no. much. Sorry, can I um, just ask one question of Christine? When is the um bike to school day again? It's the ninth. 
I, you know, and this year of I'm October, at, yeah, I'm on vacation, yeah, but um, so okay, we'll around, but October 9th, and um, yeah, the flyer just went out to oh, uh, okay. to a variety. I'm just getting it out to the school liaisons and the principals. Okay, cool. So if all goes according to plan, we should have. I don't know how soon the flyer will get out on the superintendent, but hopefully through Taleb mm -hmm. we can get out to the high school. And we could contact the elementary schools, I guess, directly, like the offices too. I mean, some of the principal sent stuff or uh. I mean, I'm I feel better about them coordinating with the parent who's actually running. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just I will getting bring out that. Sorry, okay, getting out from the, um, the newsletters that come out from all the schools who might be the parents who are on the PGA or whatever. But, you know, they don't do that as much anymore. It's, like, complicated. A lot of them don't have active, like, blogs anymore. Oh. And the high school is amazing. I mean, the high school I, does. Chris, are you I mean, doing yeah. high school? <laughs> no. Okay. I mean, uh, the yes. high school has one, but, I mean, a lot of the elementary schools have kind of given it up, and they're just, like, relying on Parent Square and... Yeah, um, it's a little sad. I, I'm sad about it, but it is what it is. All right, I will check in with Angela, and I will bring candy because Chris brought candy last year, and that was awesome, and that's how you get people to come to the table. Exactly. Yeah. I, really, I <laughs> forgot about that. That's something that I would and, like uh, to and about. um And you have all the materials that we had from the other event, Chris, so I'm going to count on you to bring those over. And um, and if we need a table, I can do a table. Um. Oh. And then we, um, yeah, so um, every, we're just basically ginning up the whole operation. And, you know, the difficulty is the high school isn't going to participate. So I like where you're going, Kim, is how can yeah. we get the schoolers into what is going to happen? And then the middle school, I haven't been able to, you know, reach back out to Ben Coblin, who I think is back in the PE role or... I, the new, the new old principal. So, um, you know, we'll see, but I think the other thing that's exciting is that Dwayne Shamble from the Family Resource Center is going to chair the Bike Safety Rodeo Committee. So, oh, so I wanted was a Bike Safety Rodeo. So I'm going to spend the fall in Guilford, I would like to have a um, a rep from DPW be on the bike safety rodeo committee. So ideally, it's APD, DPW, maybe somebody from Crest, I don't know, um, and the district. And then the hope is to have a district-wide bike safety rodeo um, in May. Um, where you know kids can rotate through stations and um now that jacob offered swag we'll have drop mobility swag we'll have lots of swag but i hope yeah. it'll be like a cool community um event i always loved yeah. those when i was a kid i love those then, um yeah i think i think Cress is great i think you got the right well and here. i was actually gonna say tabling you know chris we should also reach out to the family center if they're tabling we could like piggyback with them and we could set up safe reach to school near them yeah i, I do so um I'll, I'll i'll try to connect with angela but if the um, if they're going to be there at all if the family center is going to be there at all like that could be that could be a place to squeeze us in too <laughs> um in my opinion uh okay well, th and let's just, oh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll keep Safe Routes to School on our list for next time. We do have the Safe Routes coordinator is supposedly, um, at least we met with all the gym teachers from the elementary schools and Tori right. last spring. And so they, on paper, are committed to having Tori come in and do bike and ped education. That's awesome. Ped is K through three. And then bike education is for that's, really that's awesome. Thank you. That is so cool. That Thank should you. happen. Um, so let's keep, I'll keep safe. We just go on our agenda for our next meeting yeah. too. Okay. Um, okay. So I would like to talk about school zones, but maybe we can leave it to a future time, but. Uh, I, I have like two minutes. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, well, so we're I about to leave the forum too. <laughs>
But Guilford, if you have updates that you can share with us quickly, that would be great. Um, you know, when I leave my house, it seems like there's road construction stuff going on all over town and there's lots of detours. And But um, what's happened, like, for example, what's happening with North Pleasant Street at Kendrick? It's slowly moving along. Okay. And Heatherstone? Slowly moving along. <laughs> and uh, Route 9, Belchertown Road? Slowly moving along. Okay. So is there like kind of a date when you think any of these will be... <laughs> done or... <laughs> um, at the at the rate we're going now everything will be definitely be wrapped up probably the first of november but there's a um we keep losing the crew on north pleasant street i know go, they keep getting sent someplace else to work by warner brothers oh, okay um, warner brothers is the crew company that's on 116 right now making a oh. map 116 and they were doing that like yeah, like West Street, right down to like Pomeroy or something. I know there were closures there too. That's all states asphalt. Oh, okay. And they're they're done. And so one sixteen's all good now. Again, no, there, there's another asphalt. company coming in next week to do the final code on that. So, okay. um, we probably. I mean, there's a lot of work going on. It'll probably no, it's exciting. It's exciting to see all the work, but it's also like, oh my gosh, I need to get from point A to point B. How am I going to do that? and that's course, what i've been hearing know, from people too hadley's so. paving too oh i know yeah so no there's a lot of work going on we yeah. we do expect that our work is have, really yeah good. hadley is well of course there's the route nine work still going on and of course now they're doing rocky hill road it's very exciting very exciting guys i'm so sorry i'm gonna okay make... that's fine okay thanks Talk thanks to you. bye bye okay i guess we're gonna end uh Okay. Yeah. So we didn't have too much else. And uh but Guilford, Stefan, do you have anything to add? Comment, any concerns? Um so so Guilford, you had mentioned to me just about um like 17C and the new signs going up. Yeah, the new signs are going up. We're they're huge. They're like huge. Oh, they are. Signs. Yeah, um, they're really big. It's amazing. Wow. They're almost five feet tall. What? Like, yeah, they're they're five feet high. They're huge I've never signs. seen signs like that. Like, because you're saying they're going to be at the entrances to communities, right? But that's are all the signs for that. That seems nuts, but yeah, they're quite large signs. So we had to get some extra things to put them up. Oh, got it. Okay. But they're going in. The school safety zone is in at Cushman. The the oh. uh, it's not driver. a school. It's a safety zone. Yeah. The driver feedback signs will be going in shortly. Okay. Um, there and things are moving along. Oh, okay. Great. And I know, I mean, there's been interest. Maybe we could talk about the next meeting about um, just what's happening at, like with the, um, the signs of the middle school and the high school, like if we're going to have signs of the middle school and high school, just creating the school zones and all that. Uh, there you had mentioned previously that it needs to go to the council. So yes it's i think it's on the council's agenda for the 23rd well i know that they said they wanted to talk to you first because you've been working on it and and i, I didn't they, and well, they, i know that chief ting was interested too so so they think the council is going to take it up on the 23rd and then they're going to okay. refer it to tso got it There's, awesome progress the calendar thank you <laughs> Great. Okay. I think um now that we are done with our official meeting, uh, we can <laughs> turn off the camera. But Guilford, I did have one quick question for you once we stop um recording. Now that um, our meeting is adjourned, we've adjourned. So the yeah. TAC meeting is adjourned because we no longer have a qu 